Hi, it's Chris Flanagan here. Welcome to the Pediatric Emergencies Podcast. I hope you had a nice Christmas. Um, I certainly did, and I feel nice and relaxed. I have a couple of days left before I get back to work, so I thought I'd put my time to good use and get another podcast out. So we're currently working through Pediatric Critical Care Pearls, um, and I put the last one out about a week or so ago. So uh, this is the second part of the multi-part series, so I've got another 10 paediatric critical care pearls for you. So starting off with pearl number 11, and pearl 11 is, if the lactate isn't clearing in your septic patient, either reconsider the diagnosis or change your management plan. So anyone who listens to the podcast regularly or who works with me knows that I regard lactate clearance as a really important sign of how well you're doing with your particular patient. So when I've got a septic patient, I'm sending gases off maybe every 15 minutes during the initial resuscitation. And that meningococcal who presents with a lactate of 10, it needs to be falling rapidly with treatment. Or there's something else going on with the patient or the treatment I'm giving them isn't working. And what's important when you see that lactate not falling is that you reconsider either have I got the right diagnosis for this patient for example, you think you're assuming it's sepsis, but is this a surgical abdomen with dead gut? For example, a volvulus or an intussusception. Is this really a cardiac baby um, rather than a septic baby? Has what started off as sepsis turned into something else? Has the child now got a tension pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade, abdominal compartment syndrome? Has the patient taken some sort of toxins? Is this really anaphylaxis? Has the patient got adrenal insufficiency and they need some steroids? So it could be sepsis combined with something else or is there something mimicking sepsis? And is that why the patient's not behaving as you should expect them to? Another possibility is yes, you've got the right diagnosis. This is sepsis, but you haven't got the treatment quite right. And the commonest thing you'll see is the child started on, for example, adrenaline or dopamine. And as they don't improve, um, what tends to happen is people just turn the doses up and pile more fluid in, rather than actually thinking, is this what the patient needs? And as the doses of those drugs turn up, what you do is you squeeze the peripheral vasculature even more. So you make the heart work harder, the demand for oxygen go up, and actually you get less flow out to the tissues. Whereas with that patient, uh, what we're actually interested in is flow, rather than pressure and in some of the patients you might actually need to turn the drugs down or add in an inodilator um, to increase the flow into the tissues and maybe that's what you need to clear the lactate um, so lactate's great it helps you work out is what you're doing working and if it's not either reconsider your diagnosis or your strategy and if you want to find out a bit more about the strategies and the thinking behind the treatment approaches in sepsis I cover that in the sepsis podcast and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So pearl 12, remember to saline suction the endotracheal tube following intubation of children with bronchiolitis. So the the reason most of the time you intubate a child with bronchiolitis is because their chest is just full of so many secretions that the child can't clear them and causes increased work of breathing and respiratory failure. Um, So now you've intubated them, you've got a passage down to the lungs, so it would make sense that you go down to the lungs with a suction catheter and clear out all the secretions that were giving you the problem. Um, But you'd be surprised how many times I go out to a district general hospital to pick up a child with bronchiolitis and I'll ask, have you sucked the endotracheal tube? And quite often the answer is no. They've been worried about getting a second axis or an arterial line or urinary catheter or something else. But that's not the reason you've intubated this child. You've intubated them because there's too much secretions on the chest. So what you should do is try and take those secretions away. And now you've got a passage down into the lungs with that endotracheal tube. So what I'd recommend, you put a little bit of saline down, some bagging, and you suck out the secretions. And you do that maybe two or three times till you've cleared the chest. And you'll you'll feel that as you bag the child, you'll, you'll feel the secretions rattling about in the chest and in the tube. And as you clear it, that you'll notice that starts to disappear. And the best time to do it is immediately after the intubation. 
Um, quite often if I'm intubating a child with bronchiolitis, I'll put an oral tube in before changing it for a nasal tube. And after I put the oral tube in, quite often I'll stop, I'll hold the tube, let the nurse do a saline suction off the tube before changing it over to a nasal tube. So remember to suction the endotracheal tube immediately following intubation on children with bronchiolitis or low respiratory tract infections. Okay, moving on to pearl number 13. So uh, pearl 13 is avoid the routine administration of muscle relaxants following intubation in children with stenosis epilepticus. Um, so this just makes sense. Um, you've intubated a child because of seizures. So you want to try and determine if they're still fitting or not. So if you have the child muscle relaxed, it's very difficult to determine if the child is seizing. You're having to rely on things like pupillary dilatation, tachycardia, and hypertension, all of which can occur if your child is slightly under sedated rather than filling. So obviously you need to give some muscle relaxant to put the tube in, um, but once you've done that, um, you're best to keep the child deeply sedated if you're not planning to immediately extubate them um, and avoid the use of muscle relaxants if you can. Um, obviously the best thing to do in most of these children is to wake them up immediately following intubation if you can and try and get them extubated because most of them won't have recurrent seizures but obviously in certain regions there's not the expertise to wake the child up locally and they need to be transferred to pediatric intensive care unit to allow that so these children yes give them muscle relaxant to intubate them but then try your best not to give them any more muscle relaxant if you can so you can properly um, monitor the central nervous system so why am I making such a fuss about this particular one? Um, well, Stannis epilepticus causes just as much damage to the brain in a patient who's muscle relaxed. You just can't see the child shaking about, but the brain is still frying away. Um, and you've, the reason you've intubated this child is to try and prevent damage to the brain from a prolonged seizure. So it doesn't make any sense to lose your neuro exam by continuing to top the child up with muscle relaxants so you're not sure if the child is fitting or not. The child is at slightly higher risk than other children who are intubated of having further seizures. So after your initial bolus of muscle relaxant to put the tube in, do your best to try and avoid giving further boluses. Okay, moving on to pearl number 14. And pearl 14 is beware of the child with unexplained tachycardia. So there's a list as long as your arm of things that cause tachycardia in children, um, to name but a few, pain, pyrexia, arrhythmia, sepsis. Um, but you need to know which of these is causing the tachycardia in your child if it's persisting. So a child with a persistent tachycardia that you can't explain is telling you there's something wrong. You shouldn't ignore it. And you need to maybe carry out further examinations or tests to work out what exactly is going on with the child. So be aware of the child with an unexplained tachycardia. Okay, so moving on to pearl number 15. And pearl number 15 is there is no such thing as a cardiostable induction agent in a septic child. So there's a common misconception that ketamine is a completely safe drug to give to sick children. In most children it causes a slight elevation in blood pressure um, and it's generally well tolerated with minimal side effects. And this is because in well children, when they're given ketamine, it increases their production of endogenous catecholamines. Um, and these raised levels of catecholamines cause elevation in the blood pressure. Um, but the clapped out or septic child is a different kettle of fish altogether. This child has completely maxed out their supply of endogenous catecholamines. So when you give them a normal dose of ketamine, their blood pressure will fall. Just the same as if you've given them propofol or thiopentone, although probably not to the same degree. So what do you need to do? You need to give these children much less ketamine. Um, so most of the septic children that I'm intubating are getting 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine um, as a starting dose 
Whereas, for example, a lively child with bronchiolitis who's been intubated, I'm starting up with two milligrams per kilogram. So I'm using much less of the drug, um, but I'm also preparing for the child to decompensate on induction. Um, and this is really another talk altogether, so intubating the septic patients and how you should do it. And I do cover that in the sepsis podcast, so if you're interested, check it out there. So going on to pearl number 16, um, and pearl 16 is a little bit of that preparation that I've talked about when intubating the septic patient, and that is use push-dose pressors and peripheral vasoactive drugs. So I have done a separate talk um, covering push-dose pressors and peripheral vasoactive drugs in children, and this is something that if you deal with critically ill children who are likely to decompensate, that you need to learn to do. So you've got two options when you're dealing with a crashing peri-arrest child. Option one is you're you're not going to learn to use push dose pressors and peripheral vasoactive drugs. So you wait for the child to arrest and then give them a big dose of adrenaline. Option two, um, which is the option I would recommend, you learn to use push dose pressors and peripheral vasoactive drugs and you titrate small doses of adrenaline to prevent the child from arresting, um, which is definitely a much better option in my book. I don't want to go um, through it in a lot of detail because I have a whole podcast dealing with it. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, head over to the website and have a look at the information on uh, push dose pressors and peripheral vasoactive drugs. But it's something you need to learn to do. Okay, pearl number 17. Uh, bedside ultrasound is the quickest way to confirm or rule out a pneumothorax. So uh, most intensive care units will now have an ultrasound in them. We're using them for our vascular access. Um, but that same ultrasound machine is by far the quickest and easiest way to determine if your deteriorating patient has a pneumothorax or not. So all you do is you put the probe on the most anterior aspect of the chest because that's where the air is going to go, where it rises to the top. And if you've got pleural sliding there, the patient doesn't have a pneumothorax. If you don't have pleural sliding, um, you can put M mode through it. And you, if you see a barcode sign, you've got a pneumothorax. If you see a seashore sign, they don't have a pneumothorax. So it gives you a clear yes or no answer as to whether the patient's deterioration is due to a pneumothorax or not. I know certainly you can get an x-ray, but an x-ray is going to take at least five or ten minutes, even in the quickest places, to get the patient's film done. Um, again, you're going to have to move the patient to get a board under their back to do an x-ray as well. So ultrasound has a lot of advantages. Um, once you get the hang of it, it's really, really quick, and it certainly is a clear yes or no answer as to whether the patient has a pneumothorax. And it's also really useful when you look at the chest x-ray and you're not quite sure if it's a, a pneumothorax or not. Um, and I had a case recently where the x-ray department had phoned to say that the x-ray they'd just done uh, had been reviewed by the radiologist uh, and showed the patient had a pneumothorax. Um, we weren't expecting the patient to have a pneumothorax because the x-ray was only done for tube position. Um, and when we reviewed the x-ray, we weren't particularly convinced that there was a pneumothorax on it, but there certainly was a, a funny looking line on the chest x-ray. So we brought the ultrasound over to the bed space, um, put it over the most anterior part of the chest, and there was clear pleural sliding. Um, so we were 100% sure the patient didn't have a pneumothorax. So a really useful um, bit of kit. Um, and I have a video up on the Paediatric Emergencies website um, showing how you do it and what a pneumothorax looks like on ultrasound. And again, I'll put a link to that video into the show notes. So moving on, um, pearl number 18. You don't have to wait till you've got a dedicated CPAP machine to start giving PEEP. So this is one of my big frustrations um, that I see a child who is obviously struggling um, is almost certainly going to need intubation um, but has not been given any respiratory support while the plans for intubation are being made or while the plans for a CPAP machine to try and avoid intubation um, are made. 
And my point here is that an ERS T piece, or Mapleton C circuit, will do just as good a job of giving PEEP as a dedicated CPAP machine. So all you need to do is hold the, the mask and the circuit on the patient's face and give them PEEP with this while either plans are made for intubation or until a dedicated machine comes along. And this is often what I do. I'm called down to the resuscitation area. I see a child struggling. And before I've even taken all the history, I go and put the mask on the face and start giving the child some PEEP while I take the rest of the story. And this simple manoeuvre often provides significant improvement to the child's breathing. So you don't need to wait till you've got a dedicated machine. If you've got a simple circuit and a mask, you can give the child PEEP. So not having a CPAP machine available is not an excuse for not giving PEEP. And it's one thing that really frustrates me is seeing people standing with their arms folded while they're waiting for a machine and the child is struggling. So don't do it. Okay, moving on to pearl number 19. And pearl number 19 is consider using cooled or warm fluids if your patient needs a fluid bolus. So with this, you're kind of doing two things at once. If you've got a pyrexic child who you need to give a fluid bolus to, it makes sense that you use cool fluids because that way you're bringing the child's temperature down as well as giving your fluid bolus. Um, I, I always have some fluids in the fridge uh, for treating malignant hyperpyrexia. Um, and if I have that pyrexic child, all children look terrible. Um, when they're pyrexic, they're tachycardic, they're mottled, they look shocked. And rather than just give a normal fluid bolus, um, I think it's a great way to bring the temperature down at the same time. And often a lot of the earlier hypothermia protocols used ice sealing um, as a way of inducing hypothermia. So why not use a cool fluid to not only give your fluid bolus, but also lower the temperature. Likewise, if you've got a child who's cool and needs a fluid bolus, if you have uh, access to warm fluids, it makes sense to give the warm fluids. Okay, moving on to pearl number 20. And pearl 20 is when inserting a central line in small babies, transfix the vein using a cannula rather than using the needle that comes with a pack. So central line insertion in small babies um, really does require a completely different technique than what's used in older children and adults. And I do plan to cover this in a separate podcast at some stage. Um, but if you use the same technique that you use in adults, you use a needle, try to put it in the middle of the vein and then pass the wire, you'll probably find your success rate isn't that great. Um, and that's because the vein that you're going for in children, um, particularly the femoral veins in a neonate, is really only a few millimetres in diameter. Um, you almost will never catch the vein on the way down. Um, what tends to happen is you push against the wall of the vein, it just collapses. You'll then be through both the walls before you've noticed you've got some blood in your needle, if you do manage to get any blood in the needle at all. Then when you try and pull the needle bevel back into the centre of the lumen. Um, because the bevel is also a couple of millimetres in size, you'll get blood coming back when part of the bevel is in the lumen of the vein. So, um, And then when you, what tends to happen is people try to feed a wire down it, they've got some blood coming. But because only part of the bevel is in the vein, the wire won't feed out the end of the needle. So it's a really bad technique um, for uncertain central lines in small babies and most of the people who use this technique will find that the sometimes the line goes in sometimes it doesn't. The technique I use um, generally works first time almost every time. So what I do with ultrasound I'll position the vein in the middle of the screen, take a cannula and push the cannula straight through the vein. So I'm not even trying to aspirate on the way through. What I'll do then is take the needle out of the cannula and put a syringe over the end of the needle. I'll apply negative pressure to the cannula and bring it out millimetre by millimetre until um, blood comes into the syringe. At that point, 
um, the end of your cannula, um, which obviously doesn't have a bevel in it, has just pulled in through the far um, wall of the vein. So it's the furthest that the cannula can be into the vein. Um, at that point, once you've got free-flowing blood, all you do is push the cannula into the vein. And that just works your wire then, because you've completely cannulated the vein, the, wa the wire will go straight down the vein without any difficulty. And that technique just works. And it's the same technique I teach my registrars to put centre lines in with, and certainly after supervising them doing a couple with that technique, they generally go off and put centre lines into small babies without any difficulty. So if you are somebody who does most of your centre lines in adults, um, to move to small babies and achieve the same success rate as you do in adults, um, you will have to modify your technique slightly. And like I say, I do plan to put a podcast out um, covering the technique in more detail. Okay, so that's the second lot of 10 paediatric critical care pearls. Um, I hope you find them useful. Like I said with the last one, um, drop me some comments on the website, paediatricemergencies.com. Let me know what you think of the pearls. Let me know if you agree or disagree. And uh, if you have any further paediatric critical care pearls yourself that I haven't mentioned so far, um, please leave them in the comments section and I'll try and cover some of your best pearls in a future podcast. Thanks for listening.